uh, thank you so much for coming to uh, the uh, seminar in Ukrainian studies. Um, our speaker this evening is Svetlana Krasinska. She is an independent scholar and a Mihaichuk Research Fellow at the Ukrainian Research Institute. She has an interdisciplinary PhD from the University of San Diego in 2018, and she has nearly two decades of executive consulting and research experience in the nonprofit sector. She's also the author of several scholarly publications, including her most recent co-edited volume, which is entitled The Nonprofit Sector in Eastern Europe, Russia, and Central Asia, Civil Society, Advances and Challenges, which came out with Brill in 2018. And the title of her talk today is Below the Radar, The Power and Limits of Ukraine's Informal Civil Society. Thank you. Thank you, Emily, for the generous introduction. And um, I also want to say uh, thank you to Huri for having me here this fall. Uh, and uh, um, giving me this opportunity to work on my research and finish my, uh, hopefully, my book while I'm here. Uh, and uh, I also want to thank this very generous uh, audience for being here on this rainy afternoon. I hope to make it worth your while, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion afterwards. So uh, as Emily uh, mentioned, uh, my work is uh, situated in the interdisciplinary field of civil society studies, or nonprofit studies, or voluntary sector, or third sector studies, there are a few names. Uh, and on, in my research, I draw on um, theories from a variety of academic disciplines. And in particular, uh, in this research, I look at um, different disciplines' approaches to studying informal phenomena. So before I uh, present my findings and arguments, I want to give you a bit of a background story on what brought me to this particular topic. So prior to my um, uh, prior to going to academia, I was working in the nonprofit sector as consultant and board member and executive director. Uh, and going into my doctoral studies, um, I knew I was going to use my personal background as a born and raised Ukrainian, which I wear on my sleeves quite literally today uh, and every day. <laughs> uh, so I was going to uh, fuse my personal background with my professional background, and I knew I was going to study uh, civil society in Ukraine. So the first uh, paper I wrote as a doc student uh, started off with a review of the sector kind of what were the developments in the previous 10 years, where the sector stood, and uh, what its environment was, and what issues it faced. And of course, what I discovered was that there's been um, uh, a variety of uh, changes in the environment for nonprofits, political changes in, the, in that first decade um, of uh, this millennium. Um, of course, the economic downturn, the 2008 uh, crisis, and also some uh, significant pieces of legislation uh, adopted in that period that directly and indirectly affected the nonprofit sector. And how did um, the sector fare, considering all these uh, different uh, uh, and significant changes? Well, um, I was uh, just as surprised. According at least to the existing data on the sector, they seem to be fairly unaffected by all these changes. So uh, that sounded uh, counterintuitive for me. So I went into the field and uh, talked to leaders of nonprofits to see why that was happening. And so what came in their responses were um, a few things. So on the one hand, these established CSOs, or civil, civil society uh, organizations, which is a um, kind of a popular acronym that's used for organizations in Ukraine. And so these civil society organizations that are uh, a predominant, if not sole, um, focus of uh, sector assessment studies in Ukraine were fairly unaffected by both political and economic changes because they were heavily reliant on foreign funding. And actually, the worse the conditions were politically and economically, the more foreign funding would be pouring in, and that, w uh, that kind of um, explains some of that balance of why the sector indicators were so stable. On the other hand, the grassroots and informal organizations I talked to were significantly affected by all these changes, uh, and understandably so. But their realities weren't uh, reflected in any of the data because uh, their um, activities weren't really um, uh, reported officially. And at the same time, both the um, 
the established uh, organizations and these grassroots organizations seem to be fairly unaffected by the legislative <laughs> changes. And uh, they said, yes, we know about these new laws, but we don't really pay attention to them. The government does uh, its own thing. We do our own thing. It's like we operate in parallel universes. So speaking about parallels, I started drawing parallels with the economics literature on shadow economy to try to understand this phenomenon. And as uh, probably many of you know, uh, a significant share of Ukraine's gross domestic product, or the GDP, is produced in the informal sector. So I thought if um, half of uh, Ukraine's economy is in the shadow, it would be natural to see uh, a pretty significant amount of uh, civic activities there as well. So I uh, um, concluded that work with kind of an open question. So if we look at what really is going on, uh, rather than uh, at what is being recorded, would we see a different picture? So then, um, of course, um, Maidan happened, uh, and um, what I observed is that these po popular protests really bring up uh, the informal organizing to the surface and makes it really visible. So uh, it was a tremendous opportunity for me to um, examine these non uh, informal dynamics in the context of anti-government uh, protests where keeping things below the official radars, uh, among other things, uh, was um, actually um, a safety precaution, uh, and some, in some cases even key to survival and, and, and physical safety. So this resulted in another paper that was published uh, <laughs> long <laughs> afterwards, as you know how things work in academia. Uh, and uh, it looked specifically at organizations, a variety of organizations on Maidan that looked and behaved like CSOs, right? But they didn't have any registration with the government. So when you look at statistics and uh, sector assessment, they wouldn't be reflected on it. So this um, helped me, these and other um, uh, papers I wrote, helped me really crystallize the empirical puzzle for my uh, dissertation research. Uh, and it goes as such. Um, so civil society in Ukraine and other post-communist countries has long been diagnosed as being weak. And this assessment is based on the uh, level of citizen participation in formal civil society organizations that are uh, ostensibly, those are the ones that count when you look at civil society. And uh, the dominant explanation uh, of that dynamic uh, are these uh, so-called uh, communist legacies, right? So the decades of suppression and communist rule killed civil society, so now we have to build it from scratch. And that's kind of a dominant discourse in the civil society literature. Uh, at the same time, there is this disconnection in the literature. So we see these fluctuations in the environment, yet stable sector indicators. And we also see these powerful protests. So we have this generally diagnosed uh, apathy, this apathetic population, and once in a while, uh, which, which gives a diagnosis of weak civil society, and once in a while we have these powerful protests and overnight the civil society there gets diagnosed as a strong and vibrant civil society that's able to actually get things done and, and bring about significant change. So what is it? Is it weak or is it strong? And then there is another layer to this, uh, in this informality. So when we look at this context, where with very informal cultures, where informality really infuses every sector of society, all spheres of uh, life, uh, and uh, at the same time, we look at the literature on civil society that focuses on uh, formal organizations, uh, there is that uh, disconnect. It doesn't really reflect the empirical reality of that context. So um, who gets counted and, and who counts? So with this, I argue that in order for us to understand what civil society is and what its impact is in contexts where informality is a pervasive social phenomenon, we really need to understand the dynamics of the informal side of the society. And if we look at only the formal sector, we see 
incomplete, if not distorted, view of uh, the sector. So particularly, I argue, argue that informal practices and institutions are a vital part of Ukraine's voluntary sector, um, uh, contributing to both services and advocacy that a complex set of factors uh, drive these informal practices um, and dri uh, compels people to uh, organize informally rather than through for uh, formal means. And finally, that um, really informality uh, uh, offers a, a mixed bag of outcomes for the um, development and sustainability of civil society, both good and bad. Whereas the kind of the dominant discourse in the civil society literature is that these um, uh, uh, the reliance on informal kinship networks undermines the formal side of the sector and thus weakens civil society in general. So my argument challenges that. So uh, to get there uh, in my research, I asked three very simple and interrelated research questions to understand the informal phenomenon. First, what does the informal civil society look like, right? What are, what are the, how, how do people organize informally and what do they do, what do they accomplish? Second, why do people do it informally rather than through, uh, by joining uh, formal CSOs? And finally, what does it mean for civil society to have this vibrant informal component? What impact does it have? So before I um, present my uh, findings, I'll uh, very quickly um, touch on my methodology. Please feel free to ask questions afterwards. I'll happily <laughs> talk for an hour about my methods. But just here, um, I'll note um, that uh, very quickly that, um, of course, to uh, look at this complex social phenomenon that drove a kind of a qualitative approach uh, to my research. And uh, uh, the um, individuals who I thought had the most authority on this phenomenon were the people who were involved in these uh, activities. And so this uh, resulted in 70 interviews, mainly with leaders of uh, organizations, groups, and initiatives uh, whose work was at least to some degree, but mainly predominantly unregulated by the Ukrainian government. And I'll talk about what that means in a moment. But what I want to emphasize here is that these are the people who normally don't get asked for interviews. So these are the people who actually were in awe that someone cared enough to go talk to them. And that's just uh, puzzled me that, that uh, they are not the ones uh, being um, uh, talked to. So, uh, so this kind of makes it for a very unique data set, set because these are not the people who are usually engaged in the research. So I went to uh, Ukraine uh, and spent intense three and a half months. Uh, I went to different uh, locations in Ukraine. Uh, most of my interviews were in-person interviews. I did not go to the occupied territories, uh, but I did talk to people from Donetsk and Horlivka who lived in other cities at the time. So. Uh, uh, as to my research questions, which I, I will um, address in turn to give you a, a bit of a primer. So what does the informal civil society look like? So how do you even grasp uh, some, something that uh, basically what is informal? It's everything that's outside of formal rules and regulations, right? So uh, what I uh, focused here on are, were the entities, particularly in this uh, research question. So what are these groups like and uh, initiatives? How do they, what do they look like? What do they do and how? Uh, so uh, to narrow down, I, I created a definition of what I consider to be informal in that particular context. So the first uh, dimension of informality uh, is the governmental registration, right? So if the group or organization is not registered, uh, it's uh, absent from all forms of formal observation. It will not appear in any of the statistics, um, in any of the official uh, data. So, uh, and of course, none of their activities would be reported as well. And speaking about reporting, the other dimension of uh, informalities is financial reporting. So what I found, there were um, uh, many registered organizations that sometimes they would only be registered in name only, but conduct all of their activities informal, uh, informally. And what I mean by that, they would not report any of their financials 
to the government. So their name as an entity would be visible in the uh, data, but none of what they do, uh, do and how much and what, um, what they bring into the sector would be captured by, um, uh, by the official data, at least. So what I found th were uh, an array of uh, activities, and uh, these were practiced by organizations and groups and even individual initiatives where people would take on a mission and within their networks would accomplish a mission, but uh, the, their organization would only consist of one person. And so uh, I've also seen this spectrum of uh, informality in that some organization would uh, report none of their financial activities, some would report 10% of their activities, half, uh, and so forth. So, which brings us to the next question, so why? Why do they do it informally? Why don't they register or report? Uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, oh, pardon me. No, before I go into why, uh, I will give you a couple of examples of the organizations that uh, became part of my sample. So in my uh, uh, book that I'm writing based on this research, um, the very first chapter uh, presents 10 uh, case studies of uh, these different groups. I'll give you just a, a, um, uh, a little flavor uh, of them, and, um, uh, but there are 10 in, in my book. So first, um, I, uh, there's this um, uh, woman in this small town, in this community, who single-handedly rescued stray dogs in her community. So she would just pick them up, she would feed them, she would clean them up, she would find local vets to fix them up, and uh, then she, through her network she would uh, write articles, she would have her uh, newspaper friends write articles about different dogs and social media, she would get them adopted. The dogs that she couldn't get adopt, she would uh, make these makeshift um, shelters for them in the abandoned uh, construction site. So all kinds of things she's done. She's even um, uh, forced the local county office to open a shelter for wounded animals. So uh, now uh, the local police department has her cell phone number uh, on file. So if there is an uh, ab abandoned or wounded animal, they call her because they know she will mobilize the, you know, the rescue unit and to figure out what to do with this dog. Right, so, uh, and completely unregistered, I, when I asked her, are you considering, uh, she thought that was crazy, why would I register? <laughs> so, um, an organization, I'm just saving dogs. So uh, then there is uh, uh, another case study is this crisis center. So there is this uh, center, the kind of ad hoc center to uh, um, cater to the needs of in uh, internally displaced um, individuals who flee the war zone and uh, the occupied Crimea. So this is a, an organization that eventually did register with the government in order to receive uh, large amounts of uh, humanitarian aid coming in. And so even to get through the, the, uh, that aid through the customs, they needed to have an official entity so they didn't have to pay taxes. Uh, it's a, uh, it was a fairly substantial operation in 2016 when I studied them. Uh, but uh, other than institutional grants and this humanitarian aid that came officially from abroad, they weren't reporting really any other um, uh, financials to the government. Then there is this uh, um, a kind of a completely different kind of um, activity. I call it urban vibe. So there are these um, uh, young professionals in the um, ex town of Ukraine, uh, right, who felt a bit provincial in their uh, location because none of the artists or, or writers would come in and you know not, not wanting to move to Kyiv or Lviv like a lot of other uh, 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 their other friends did they wanted to bring the mountain to the Mohammed um, so mm -hmm. they were uh, organizing public lectures and bringing in artists and this is the organization that was getting foreign foundation grants in the form of cash in an envelope because they were an unregistered group, right? So this is something that's emerging, although it's not mainstream yet. So this is the organization that said, this is the best uh, relationship I've had with a funder where we actually know them. They know us, we trust each other. So they can give us this uh, envelope and they know what we will do with that money. 
And so uh, there's another group, and uh, there are historians in the room, so I had to bring the Historic Society. <laughs> so uh, uh, so uh, as, as some of you know, in 2015, this decommunization law was passed in Ukraine, right? The controversial, but um, so before it was passed, uh, this uh, group of activists in a small town got together and said, we need to decommunize our, uh, our town. So uh, they came together and talked to local historians, to community. It was really a communal process talking about how do we rename our Lenin Boulevard and our Octo Red October Square. So by the time the laws were passed, they already had a comprehensive strategy in place. Uh, they did a comparative study with other cities, and they thought they, theirs was better than the one in Lviv. Uh, you know, so, but what happened as, resu as in the process, people uncovered all this fascinating history in their town, and people wanted to know more. So uh, it, it got these people together and said, let's, let's create history. Let's, uh, let's uh, create a, a local historic society. So what they're doing uh, is they're creating Wikipedia pages on these uh, local prominent um, figures, and they, they are developing the guided tour of their town, going to these different uh, prominent places. They go to schools, popularizing uh, not just uh, lo local history, but history in general, and do all kinds of uh, nifty other things. And they, they were in the process of um, doing this uh, um, the uh, the code that you can QR. scan QR yeah, yeah. Uh, code so you could on the side of the building you could scan it and it would give you the information so all kinds of interesting things and ten to se seven or ten very active members and then um, also volunteers they also have zero interest in um, becoming formalized they said we don't need any external support why do we need all this bureaucracy and then of course my uh, list would be incomplete without um, uh, a, a group from the uh, recently emerged volunteer movement um, aiding the Ukrainian army. And so this particular organization that I write about, they uh, actually had a substantial uh, operations and they even crowdsourced an emergency vehicle and would send a volunteer uh, medical workers uh, on the battlefields to evacuate the wounded and provide first aid and uh, did all kinds of um, things in the support of the army, but they report nothing to the government because of, um, uh, for a variety of reasons. They actually, if you want to give them money, they send you, uh, send volunteer with you to the store to buy what they need to bring to the uh, uh, front lines, and then you bring it back. And this way, there, there's just no cash um, going through their accounts at all. So um, now back to why. Um, why do people uh, resist this formalization? And um, there isn't an easy answer to that question. So I found kind of a complex um, set of factors. So uh, on the um, kind of uh, the external factors that kind of the repel formalization, which I call the demand side, right? It's uh, the uh, mainly political and legislative environment. Uh, some organizations uh, consider it impossible uh, given the, the political and legislative environment. Either their um, activity is extra legal or is not, um, is not regulated by, the, uh, by uh, the, the existing laws or they feel that the regulatory burden will be so high that it will render their work virtually impossible. And it's true for a lot of small groups. Uh, on the other, uh, uh, on the bottom of that is that really the, the bureaucracy is just not worth it. So this is the cost benefit calculation. What do I get from registering and formalizing my activity versus what I have to put into it? And when the, the benefits uh, don't outweigh the, um, the inputs, uh, then people choose to exit from the formal domain. Then on the other side, uh, which I call supply side, which is the factors innate to society uh, itself, I look at um, informality as a norm. This is the culture of informality that's really prevalent in Ukraine um, uh, at the time. So I won't go too much into that right now, but uh, look at the bottom of this, my blue square. So informality uh, on the individual uh, factor side, so informality is really just the default uh, activity. 
right? People don't even think that they would need to uh, uh, formalize. Informal action is faster, it's cheaper, makes you more maneuverable, it makes you a lot more independent. And especially advocacy groups really value that very highly because they feel that they then have this tremendous luxury to be a lot more honest and speak the truth into people's faces instead of uh, being um, uh, diplomatic, <laughs> you know, in, in order to get grants. So at the heart of um, this diagram, I have these magnetic forces of trust, right, without which there is no civil society and mutual cooperation. So this, uh, this trust uh, um, serves as a, as a glue uh, connecting all these various uh, factors, but also acting as a um, mechanism for informal action. And uh, just to give a little <laughs> joke in the middle to, to lighten up the dense material, you know, how could you swindle all these good people who trusted you? Well, you can't swindle people who don't trust you. So, um, so Ukrainians are known to be very weary of, you know, being swindled, and they feel often swindled by um, their government. There's plenty of literature that talks about the low levels of distrust uh, in, uh, among Ukrainian population to their government. But I, what I also talk about um, in uh, my work is that, uh, is that there's also this other institutional distrust. And uh, I talk more about the distrust of formal civil society organization, how that affects the, the resistance to, inf uh, to formalization. And so, of course, offsetting the, this prevailing distrust, um, there is uh, this um, trust of friends and family. This is where this informal action lives, in, in, within these uh, 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 family and friendship networks, but also within networks that were built based on joint experience, and especially in uh, a crisis experience, such as Maidan, uh, the revolutions, the protests, or volunteering at the, uh, at the front lines. So now, um, what does it mean to have this informal component uh, to civil society? And how can we even begin assessing its <coughs> impact? How do we grasp it? So to do that, I um, look, uh, I, I ask my question of what the impact is, uh, looking um, for answers through these uh, three lenses of uh, major um, uh, discourses in civil society literature. Uh, in, uh, in the contemporary context. And so these three la lenses, uh, first, the first lens uh, for um, considers civil society as a part of society. So this is the associational life uh, in the traditions of Alexis de Tocqueville. This is the schools of democracy and social capital that were Robert Putnam and his followers. So the, these, these are the uh, associations, right, the, the voluntary associations. And um, the, a bulk of nonprofit um, and civil society literature looks at civil society through this particular lens and, oh, this nifty, um, uh, through this particular lens. And this is why we see such a heavy focus on formal organizations, because this lens looks at organizations. And of course, the formal ones are the ones that are easier to uh, study. So the second lens, uh, purports that civil society is the kind of society. So this is the good society uh, uh, characterized by positive values and norms and the ability to uh, reach common goals. And finally, um, uh, the third lens looks at civil society as a public sphere. So this is a space uh, where people come to bring their differences, where, where they deliberate, where, where they collaborate across institutions and across sectors. So um, given these three lenses, I ask three specific questions in my assessment of the impact. So first, uh, what are the forms and functions of Ukraine civil society? It does the informal action uh, contribute to democracy? Second, what are the norms and values at place, and do they enhance um, capacity uh, uh, of the population to solve common problems? And finally, does informality promote uh, or detract from constructive uh, deliberation, the creation of um, new publics? 
So I look at each of these in turn, and when I look at the part of society, um, uh, the very kind of prominent finding is that the civil society, the informal civil society, is a very much outcome-driven uh, part of of society. What they are, uh, uh, um, their goal is to reach very specific objectives, to get things done as efficiently as effectively as possible in a highly volatile and resource deficient environment. Uh, and uh, informality helps them be maneuverable through these uh, um, uh, volatile uh, conditions. <coughs> so, however, because of the lack of institutionalization, kind of they, they do lack that bigger uh, picture of strategic thinking and sustainability as well. But uh, uh, even given their kind of the weakness the, uh, that they bring to the table, I also saw that this informal uh, association uh, was upsetting some of the negative side effects of these institu institutionalization processes that are driven by Western, uh, by Western, um, <laughs> So that are driven by these uh, uh, theories and practices that were developed in the Western context. And um, so there are also some nascent uh, visions of democracy, but the, uh, attend, uh, the efforts I've seen as uns in, uh, unsystematic, uh, in the, at least in the informal domain, because the focus is on uh, short-term goals and outcomes. So when I look at the kind of society uh, lens, I've seen these tensions between the uh, kind of the visions of formal institutions and them being uh, associated with uh, with um, uh, unresponsive and corrupt uh, uh, institutions, and the civil society's visions of this what is authentic civic engagement, right? So, um, so th there are these relational, uh, informal, and uh, kind of family-like values of uh, trust and um, openness and honesty. So there is this tension between the two kinds of institutions, at least the, in, in terms of perceptions of those institutions. But also what I've seen in this, the kind of society lens, that the, this kind of uh, civil society uh, really finds uh, in this informal action um, the uh, autonomy from these uh, antagonistic sometimes formal institutions. And informality helps them to um, expand their civic agency. So they do feel like they can get come in and get things done for themselves, and they don't need to wait for the government or uh, some other third party to come in and rescue them. They uh, are in control. So finally, the public sphere uh, lens uh, was probably the most challenging one uh, because of all kinds of challenges just um, in Ukraine's public sphere, and also because of the, these um, uh, the public and private spheres being so intermeshed in Ukraine. Uh, and so what I've seen that the, unfortunately civil society does not have a prominent space in the public sphere, formal or informal, except the mass protests. And there are pros and cons in the public sphere uh, of being informal. So on the one hand, the informal communication uh, really um, um, uh, alleviate some of the hurdles of the bureaucrat uh, of, bureau uh, of the bureaucratic side of the public process, and especially with social media, it levels the uh, playing field. But also, it um, kind of creates sometimes fractured and disconnected poli uh, polities that are focused on very narrowed and localized um, agendas. So, uh, in the um, overall, when I look at my findings. I uh, see two major topics that emerged from this research. The first is the formal and informal interactions and their effects on civil society. And the second one is the efficacy of the institution building uh, processes that are driven uh, predominantly by Western uh, developed theory and practice. So uh, um, as to the first uh, major topic, so uh, as I was uh, uh, mentioning earlier, 
So uh, there is this dominant discourse, the kind of dominant uh, school of thought that the informal uh, side of civil society is a, a, is a residual phenomenon. Uh, what really counts are these formal organizations. We need to invest in these institutions. And uh, uh, these informal groups will either um, uh, formalize at some point and, and uh, will count, or they uh, will just fall off and remain being unconsequential, or worse, re, uh, continue undermining the formal sector. So in one of the studies that's um, interestingly um, uh, titled um, Defining Civil Society in Ukraine, which came out in 2017, uh, the study actually completely excluded informal groups and saying that only 5% of them really become formal uh, for them to even count. So that was interesting. So what I'm uh, uh, what I am doing with this work is uh, challenging that train of thought, and um, actually uh, I'm looking at the economics and political science literature that um, support my argument for civil society. Uh, for instance, in the economics uh, literature, it's um, a well-established fact that informal economies don't necessarily ruin the formal economies. They actually, in many contexts, especially in the developing contexts, they uh, buttress the economy uh, in general. And this wasn't an established fact uh, a couple of decades, a few decades ago, but it is now. So uh, can we use that uh, in the context of civil society as well? In the political science uh, literature, there is also this notion that you know informal institutions don't necessarily undermine formal institutions, or at least not always. That's not always the case, that the relationship between formal and informal is much more nuanced. And uh, they offer uh, typologies of these interactions. So what I'm um, um, su <coughs> suggesting is also to create these uh, new typologies of interactions of formal and informal and kind of bring it to the table as a visible actor. And then uh, there is uh, this notion that um, as I said, they will continue undermining the formal sector unless uh, they get formalized. And I channel, uh, uh, cha um, and that this uh, also there is this notion that it's a um, it's a, um, a phenomenon that's characteristic of this transition context. This, so once this developing context becomes <coughs> more developed, there will be uh, the informality will go away and we'll have stronger formal institutions and. Uh, uh, the informality literature challenges that notion as well because informality is here to stay. The levels of, inform of informal um, action has not gone down since the dissolution of Soviet Union. In some countries, it, it's even gone, gone up. So um, we have to, it, it is uh, a force to be reckoned with, and we need to understand what it is, at least in the foreseeable future. So, uh, but um, then you'll ask, but what about institutions? Don't we need strong institutions? Um, then, of course, we do. Uh, however, the question is, what kind of institutions? So, well, of course, we all want a consolidated, institutionalized, strong sector. Uh, it doesn't seem like it's um, going to be achieved by uh, introducing uh, these imported institutions that were that were developed in the Western context, and if we look at theories uh, in the uh, nonprofit theories, most of the theories really were developed in Western Europe and United States. Uh, however, what we're seeing right now in the dynamics of the this these um, kind of uh, imported institution building processes is that they uh, are bringing about very mixed um, outcomes. And on the one hand, we have these informal groups that, um, uh, that uh, do not get the support that they need uh, and, and deserve. Uh, uh, and they uh, resist formalizing. Uh, but on the other hand, we have this uh, institutionalized formal sector that's uh, loss, uh, chronically uh, lacking the grassroots base, so this elitist sec uh, sector. So uh, we do need institutions, however, they uh, need to be built from the ground up. And they need to really consider these contextual nuances in, um, in, in each of the, the contexts. And they need to um, reflect the norms and values uh, that cultivate trust uh, within society to have this more um, widespread support.
So, uh, but so what? How do we build them? What can we do? Um, so in, at least in terms of uh, policy and practice, there are some kind of bullet point things we can do, uh, not in kind of the big picture building of these institutions, but at least to remove hurdles to institution building. And uh, when we look at the formal policy, uh, of course, the, uh, when we um, ask scholars what to do, to address, you know, to reduce uh, levels of informality, they'll tell you deregulate. But uh, the easy button for the governments in dealing with informality is, no, we need more regulations and make it more strict so there is no shadow economy. So, uh, but um, whatever, uh, whatever uh, new regulations that are in place, uh, and they need to, as we've seen, you know, in, in the, a big part of why people are informal is the regulation, or at least the perception of it. Um, they need to conform to the norms, to the informal norms, in order to really have an effect and be enforced. But also we need to uh, uh, look, when we look at the policy overall, uh, there are these macro issues that e economic and political instability in contexts where uh, the economy is struggling and the political environment is highly unstable, we will always see a very high level of informal practices uh, because usually, uh, because often that's the, the key to adaptation and survival. So there has to be, uh, whatever, uh, in terms of policy, there has to be a big picture perspective uh, in addition to um, concrete laws. <coughs> so uh, there are also things that uh, the external uh, funding that the philanthropic community can do uh, in uh, kind of re- um, structuring the way uh, they think about the informal side of civil society. You know, uh, for instance, re-examining their change uh, logics. And in Nonprofit Speak, it's um, a document that outlines this is the change we want to see and this is how we go about it. So how do we uh, uh, engage these informal stakeholders in creating of these change logics? Of course, it's uh, easier said than done because you, first of all, need to get to know them and trust them, and they would have to trust you, and um, it is a long-term process. And um, also, and I heard this across the board from um, small organizations, uh, the, the grant programs need to be more accessible uh, because it is the big star organizations that know how to do grant speak, but the smaller ones won't. Uh, but who will bring about the change from the bottom up? So um, to uh, conclude, how do we uh, really build these civil society, uh, effective civil so society institutions in the big picture? And I want to finish with another um, uh, cartoon. You know, you, you should be more specific here in step two. And uh, what I've seen uh, in this process of institution building, so right, the, the step one is this is where your civil society is. It's uh, non-existent to weak, and you need to build a step. You need to get to the step three. This is how civil society really works, and this is how to build a strong one, because that works in the United Kingdom or in Florida. You know, uh, so so then you know we'll get there somehow. So um, so there's been a lot of blind spots in this step two, and unfortunately the miracle has not occurred. And uh, I believe that it is uh, the process of getting there that's more important than what we envision as the outcome of the civil society. Is that because? Um, you can't build civil societies from scratch. They are embedded in, in these contexts, and uh, every context will have their own flavor. So you can't even, um, you know, you can't grow a civil society out of nothing, right? So you can't even grow kids uh, from scratch. And as a, as a parent of two, I know that there are some ground rules, but the approaches to them are radically different sometimes, right? This is what, and what 
it means to grow a good person will mean different for uh, my son and for my daughter. So um, I wonder if similar, uh, something similar can be applied to the civil society, so especially in these post-totalitarian uh, contexts. So something that uh, uh, will uh, um, foster civil society in Vietnam, right, will be very different from Venezuela. So how do we, uh, so, so getting there, I think, is, um, will define uh, in the end what a strong civil society is in, the, in, in uh, this particular context. So on that um, optimistic note, I will conclude and thank you so much. I'm looking forward to your questions.